Be sure to follow my ministry on BitChute and Rumble because this channel could disappear any day. Also, if you haven't already, subscribe to my YouTube backup channel. Links are in the description box and in my pinned comment below. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963. Thank you all so much for your prayers and support. God bless. Welcome to the Watchman channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Shalom, this is Yitzhak Ruven from the Temple Institute. Today is the first day of March, 2021. It's the 17th of Adar, 5781. And as you can see, I'm standing in front of two, they're kind of hidden at the moment, two parot adumot, two red heifers that the Temple Institute is raising here in Israel. And I'm giving you an update on their status. The last update was about uh, seven or eight months ago. And at the time we had two red heifers who were getting very close to the age where they could be converted into the ashes of the red heifer. But they had some white hairs, which we hope would go away. They didn't. So they are not kosher. Here are other parot, other heifers that are also approaching the right age and they are 99.9% .9 red, but each one does have a few hairs that aren't red, which makes them pasul, which makes them not kosher in terms of being a red heifer. So again, as we explained last time we spoke, there is a chance that those white hairs could turn into red hairs. And so we just have to wait and see. So we're no closer than we were half a year ago when we last uh, checked up on the cows, but takes patience and uh, we have lots of patience. We've been waiting 2,000 years. We'll wait a little bit longer till we get a perfectly red heifer so that we can proceed with preparing the ashes and arriving at a situation where we can actually achieve purity, uh, tahara, purity of the highest level, the level that's needed in order to do the service in the Holy Temple and for the pilgrims to actually arrive and bring their offerings. We're coming very close to Passover. And of course, on Passover, everyone in Israel is intended to bring a lamb for the Passover offering and to actually come with the lamb into the temple courtyards. And for that, we need the red heifer in order to achieve the temple purity that is necessary. So once again, Yitzhak Reuven from the Temple Institute here with our red heifers. We'll keep you updated. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. What is the significance of a red heifer in the Bible? And is a red heifer a sign of the end times? According to the Bible, the red heifer, a reddish-brown cow, probably no more than two years old, which had never had a yoke on it, was to be sacrificed as part of the purification rites of the Mosaic Law. The slaughtering of a red heifer was a ceremonial ritual in the Old Testament sacrificial system as described in Numbers 19, 1-10. Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, This is the ordinance of the law which the Lord has commanded, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, that they bring you a red heifer without blemish, in which there is no defect, and on which a yoke has never come. You shall give it to Eliezer the priest, that he may take it outside the camp, and it shall be slaughtered before him. And Eliezer the priest shall take some of its blood with his finger, and sprinkle some of its blood seven times directly in front of the tabernacle of meeting. Then the heifer shall be burned in his sight, its hide, its flesh, its blood, and its offal shall be burned. And the priest shall take cedar wood and hyssop and scarlet, and cast them into the midst of the fire, burning the heifer. Then the priest shall wash his clothes, he shall bathe in water, and afterward he shall come into the camp. The priest shall be unclean until evening, and the one who burns it shall wash his clothes in water, bathe in water, and shall be unclean until evening. Then a man who is clean shall gather up the ashes of the heifer and store them outside the camp in a clean place, and they shall be kept for the congregation of the children of Israel for the water of purification. It is for purifying from sin. And the one who gathers the ashes of the heifer shall wash his clothes and be unclean until evening. It shall be a statute forever to the children of Israel and to the stranger who dwells among them. After the red heifer was sacrificed, her blood was sprinkled at the door of the tabernacle. 
the imagery of the blood of the red heifer without blemish being sacrificed and its blood cleansing from sin is a foreshadowing of the blood of Christ shed on the cross for believers' sin. Jesus was without blemish, just as the red heifer was to be. As the red heifer was sacrificed outside the camp, in the same way, Jesus was crucified outside of Jerusalem. Hebrews 13, 11, and 12 For the bodies of those animals, whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin, are burned outside the camp. Therefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Many anticipate the birth of a red heifer because in order for a new temple to function, according to the Old Testament law, a red heifer would have to be sacrificed for the water of cleansing used in the temple. So, when a red heifer is born, which is quite unusual, it might be a sign that the third temple will soon be rebuilt. Swarms of locusts are roaring back in East Africa. The bugs are a grasshopper variant. Usually they're solitary, but in the right conditions, dry spells followed by rain, they can turn into large hungry swarms. Climate change has contributed to more frequent locust swarms. And that's bad news for farmers and any vegetation in their path. While locusts aren't known to directly hurt humans, they can strip green areas quickly, devastating crops and habitats. Locusts have been bothering people for a long time. They're one of the biblical plagues, and they continue to bedevil growers. This month, farmers in Kenya banged on pots and pans to try to drive away the locusts that threaten their crops. They're grateful as well for a government-sponsored pesticide program. Workers coat the plants of this tea farm in an attempt to control the swarms. The stakes are high, as this official noted. I'm afraid that uh, my people, rather the people of my community, might run short of food. Exodus 10, 12 through 15. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the land of Egypt for the locusts, that they may come upon the land of Egypt and eat every herb of the land, all that the hail has left. So Moses stretched out his rod over the land of Egypt, and the Lord brought an east wind on the land all that day and all that night. When it was morning, the east wind brought the locusts, and the locusts went up over all the land of Egypt and rested on all the territory of Egypt. They were very severe. Previously, there had been no such locusts as they, nor shall there be such after them. For they covered the face of the whole earth, so that the land was darkened, and they ate every herb of the land and all the fruit of the trees which the hail had left. So there remained nothing green on the trees or on the plants of the field throughout all the land of Egypt. Joel 1.4 What the chewing locust left, the swarming locust has eaten. What the swarming locust left, the crawling locust has eaten. And what the crawling locust left, the consuming locust has eaten. Joel 1.15 Alas for the day! For the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as destruction from the Almighty. There is no doubt that the prophet Joel was warning his readers about a future day when God would judge all people. The day of the Lord the prophet Joel is referring to is the seven-year tribulation. Jesus said, as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, there would be an increase in deception, false Christ who will deceive many, wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, Christian persecution, apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. As officials from China and the U.S. agree to meet in Alaska next week, the war drums are beating louder as the U.S. plans to bolster its military presence in the Pacific, agitating China. China's President Xi Jinping has told his armed forces to be prepared, pointing to what he calls an unstable situation with other nations. RT's Alex Mihailovich has the story. First stage ignition to missile. It's a request from the U.S. military that is aimed at China. During a Senate Armed Services Committee hearing, Admiral Phil Davidson, commander for U.S. Indo-Pacific Command, asked for more long-range missiles to be deployed in his region of operation. 
saying it is critically important to stabilize what is becoming a more unstable environment in the Western Pacific. With America increasingly active in Asia, China is not sitting by and waiting. China's Ministry of Finance revealed earlier this month that its defense spending would be increased to 6.8 percent this year, the largest boost to the budget since 2019. In addition, this week, Chinese President Xi Jinping told the country's military that it must be prepared to respond to a variety of complex and difficult situations at any time and to resolutely safeguard national sovereignty, a statement many believe alludes to the U.S.'s attitude towards the country, both militarily and diplomatically. Here's U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken. China is the only country with the economic, diplomatic, military and technological power to seriously challenge the stable and open international system, all the rules, values and relationships that make the world work the way we want it to. From criticizing China's handling of the city of Hong Kong to promoting unproven claims about the mistreatment of a minority population in the country's west, the U.S. has bashed Beijing, actions that can easily be described as meddling in China's internal affairs. And then there's Taiwan. In 1979, the U.S. adopted the One China Policy, in which it acknowledges Beijing's claim that Taiwan is an inseparable part of China. However, the U.S. has unapologetically increased ties with Taiwan, continuing independent trade and bolstering weapon sales to the island. Well, our position on Taiwan remains clear. We will stand with friends and allies to advance our shared prosperity, security and values in the Indo-Pacific region. Although it has tolerated attacks on many fronts, when it comes to Taiwan, China has drawn its line in the sand. The One China Principle is the political foundation of the China-U.S. relationship and an insurmountable red line. On the Taiwan issue, there is no room for compromise or concession from the Chinese government. We would like to see a clear departure from the previous administration's dangerous practices of crossing the line and playing with fire. And we hope the Taiwan issue could be handled prudently and properly. Among other issues, there's also the South China Sea, resource-rich and highly traveled waters claimed by China and several other nations. The U.S. has repeatedly challenged China's assertion, sailing military vessels in the area. With the situation already concerning to many, President Joe Biden's administration has made it clear that it intends to challenge China in its own neighborhood. The U.S. president plans to hold a first-ever virtual meeting this coming Friday with the leaders of Australia, India and Japan. The talks between the so-called Quad leaders are seen as a step towards consolidating an emerging alliance against China. The Chinese government has signaled it's happy to see Joe Biden in the White House instead of Donald Trump. But does it see Biden as a pushover because of his administration's many business ties to China? And could that somehow lead to a military miscalculation? Some experts believe these are dangerous times, with the Chinese government probing to see if Joe Biden will stand up to it. This is, I think, a far more dangerous time than it was under Trump. China expert Gordon Chang. I think they really were afraid of Trump. They were apprehensive because they couldn't predict him. I think that because Trump was unpredictable, that the risk of war was abnormally low. And apparently they don't think very much of Biden. They think that they can push him around. The Biden administration's ties to China are many. Secretary of State Tony Blinken, Director of National Intelligence Avril Haines, and White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki all worked for a consulting firm called WestExec, which helped businesses and universities get established in China and which on its webpage uses images that suggest access to the White House. Ben Weingarten is with the Claremont Institute. The myriad cabinet members and other senior administration officials who are going to be responsible for implementing the president's agenda and crafting it with respect to communist China, who all have dealings at most two degrees separated from Chinese Communist Party linked entities and individuals. So the whole administration writ large at the top levels has questions to answer with respect to financial and business dealings with respect to China, the Chinese Communist Party. Those dealings are forcing Biden's Asia czar, Kurt Campbell, to agree to recuse himself from conflicts of interest. Hunter Biden made millions from China deals while dad was vice president in the Obama administration. And there's also Hunter Biden's laptop, with apparent references to Joe Biden as the big guy. 
that showed up repeatedly in leaked business emails. It's led some to ask whether the Chinese government could use what it knows about Hunter's activities in China to push for concessions from the White House. The conflict of interest appearance alone presents myriad ethics and corruption issues for Joe Biden. And just the fact that it's known that he has those dealings alone is potential leverage against Joe Biden. While Joe Biden has not yet reversed Donald Trump's Chinese tariffs or travel restrictions, he's already made excuses for China's campaign of genocide against the Muslim Uyghur people. Meanwhile, China has become more aggressive since the Biden inauguration. Incursions into Taiwan's airspace have increased. Chinese aircraft conducted a simulated attack on the USS Theodore Roosevelt Carrier Group while it was sailing in the South China Sea. And China's foreign minister has publicly warned the Biden White House not to meddle in China's affairs. John 15, 18 through 20. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Jesus said as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, Christians would be persecuted as we read in Matthew 24, 9 and Luke 21, 12. Matthew 24, 9. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Luke 21, 12. But before all these things, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons. You will be brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. The world is becoming less free. That according to the latest Global Freedom Survey by Freedom House. And if you follow the news regularly, you know that the persecution of Christians worldwide is on the upswing. Our next guest knows a lot about it. He's traveled to restricted and hostile countries for the voice of the martyrs for more than 20 years. Todd Nettleton is the host of VOM Radio, author of the new VOM book, When Faith is Forbidden, 40 Days on the Front Lines with Persecuted Christians. So, Todd, it's good to see you again. Before we discuss the book, I know you've served the persecuted church now for 20 years. I'm sure you've seen persecution grow worse. So why do you think it's getting worse? Why is that happening? You know, I, I think part of the answer to that question is actually good news. And the reason that persecution is increasing in many places is because the church is growing. There are more Christians in the Middle East. There are more Christians in China, which means there are more potential targets for persecution. So yes, persecution is increasing, but in part, at least, that's actually good news because it represents the growth of the church. So let's begin with those detailed in five chapters of your book, Turkey, the Malatya Martyrs. Now, next month, it'll be 14 years since the death of those three Christians. Now, there are two Turks and a German. Remind us what happened to them, Todd, and, and what did you learn from meeting with their families? Well, as you say, two Turks and a German Christian were killed in the offices of a Christian publishing house there in Malatya in central Turkey. Uh, the five guys who committed the murders had posed as seekers. In fact, two of them had visited the church. They had met with the pastor. They'd asked questions uh, indicating, hey, we want to know more about Jesus. We want to know more about being a Christian. All of that was a ruse in order to set up a meeting at the Christian publishing house where they showed up with ropes and knives and they killed our three brothers. Uh, I had the chance to be in Turkey just seven weeks after those killings and uh, got to meet numerous people involved in the story. I met the two widows from the two martyrs who had been married. I met the fiance of the third martyr who was engaged at the time of his death. What I came away with was just the faithfulness of God and the amazing courage, particularly of the two widows. Uh, just 24 hours after their husbands were killed, they were on national television in Turkey forgiving the men who had killed their husbands, offering forgiveness, literally echoing the words of Christ on the cross, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. A Muslim journalist in Turkey said those two ladies, by offering forgiveness, did more for Christianity in Turkey than a thousand missionaries could have done in a thousand years. 
That's the impact of the forgiveness. And I think that's part of the reason that that story has so impacted and, and so stayed with me all these years. Forgiveness is an essential part of the life of believers, as we read in Ephesians 4.32. And be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. God promises that when we come to him confessing our sin and asking for forgiveness, he freely grants it, as we read in 1 John 1.9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Likewise, the forgiveness we extend to others should know no limits, as we read in Luke 17, 3 and 4. Take heed to yourselves. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times in a day returns to you, saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. Why do we forgive? because we have been forgiven. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Time is short. Accept Jesus today. And I'm always amazed at the attitude of Christians who have been in prison for their faith. You feature quite a few in the book, but tell us about Mrs. Choi, the woman from North Korea, and what she told you about her time in the gulag there. You know, Mrs. Choi had just an incredibly sad story, and it was, it was hard to sit with her and listen to the suffering that she had had. One of the amazing things about Mrs. Choi's story, her husband was in the Communist Party in North Korea. He was a person of some influence. And so at the end of her trial, her first trial, she was actually found innocent. The, the judge said, you're innocent. These charges are, have no merit. You can go. Well, the Communist Party, the North Korean, the regime there, they, they couldn't allow that to stay. So they quickly said, oh, wait a minute. We're going to have a redo. We're going to have another trial. This time, before she was taken to the trial, Mrs. Choi was beaten so severely that she couldn't even speak at the trial. She couldn't even talk in her own defense. And of course, this time the regime got the, the verdict that they wanted. She was found guilty and sent off to prison. Like our sisters in Turkey, the, the Christians we meet have already come to the point of forgiveness. They've been able to say, you know, through the power of the Holy Spirit, I forgive my persecutors. Uh, Sister Troy wasn't there yet. I think one of the things that helps us to do is it helps us pray for Christians who are in that spot. They've been persecuted, and they're trying to forgive, but they're not there yet. And we can pray that the Holy Spirit will empower them to come to that point of saying, I forgive. I forgive even the people who persecuted me. You're among the first to interview our mutual friend from the Czech Republic, Peter Yashik. He was in prison for 15 months with ISIS jihadists in Sudan. You've known Peter for a long time, so have I. You were surprised, though, when you met him shortly after his release. Why was that? We wondered, as I went to Czech Republic to meet with him after his release, what, what's going to be left? What's going to have happened to Peter? How is Peter going to be in comparison to the Peter that we used to know before prison, before being in a cell with ISIS fighters? And I came back from Czech Republic, and I told my wife, he's the same Peter. He just loves Jesus more now. Somehow, that 14 months in prison had actually strengthened his love for Christ and deepened his love for Christ. And, and so I came back and said, he's the same Peter, but he loves Jesus even more now than he did before. A lot of great stories, loving Jesus more. Luke 21, 25. And there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars, and on the earth distress of nations, with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. One of the many signs we are living in the last days, right before the return of Jesus Christ, is nations will be in a state of perplexity or uncertainty over what to do in a difficult situation. This is exactly what is happening in our world today. Myanmar's military is using increasingly lethal tactics and weapons normally seen on the battlefield. Its target, protesters and bystanders across the country. That's according to new research from Amnesty International. The rights group verified dozens of videos like this one and says they confirm security forces are engaging in what it calls systematic and premeditated killings. It was around the 28th of uh, February 
that we started seeing a pattern of more lethal force, people being shot with live rounds and being killed uh, in, in the process. Uh, earlier on, there had been a mixed use of live bullets and rubber bullets, but uh, now what we're seeing is a, a mounting death toll. In this video recorded on March 2nd in Yangon, Amnesty International says a commander can be seen standing over an officer operating a sniper rifle and appears to be giving him orders to direct his fire towards specific protesters. Since last month's military coup, thousands have held daily protests across the country. An increasingly bloody crackdown by security forces has so far led to dozens of deaths. According to the UN, at least 61 people have been killed. Activists believe the death toll is higher. In another development, Amnesty International reports some soldiers deployed to Myanmar's second city of Mandalay belong to the 33rd Light Infantry Division. That's the division which has been accused of war crimes against the Muslim Rohingya in the Western Rakhine State in 2017. These are the Light Infantry Divisions that have been responsible for heinous crimes elsewhere in the country that are now out on the streets shooting people. Videos analysed by Amnesty also appear to show civilians being beaten at the hands of security guards. But the demonstrators say they're undeterred, showcasing their resilience to military rule by continuously adapting their tactics, no matter how much violence they face. Yemen is heading towards large-scale starvation and could face the world's worst famine in decades. The UN's warning comes as malnutrition rates hit record highs after years of conflict. The world body estimates more than 16 million Yemenis could go hungry this year. Children are particularly affected, with 400,000 at risk of severe malnutrition. The UN has appealed for $3.8 billion to avert a catastrophe, but it says it's only got half of what's needed as of last year, and millions of people have not received any food at all. The Saudi military coalition has been fighting Houthi rebels since it launched its offensive to support Yemen's government in 2015. Well, Yemen remains the world's worst humanitarian crisis. 80% of the population is in need of urgent humanitarian assistance. Half a million Yemenis live in, quotes, famine-like conditions, and five million more are just one step behind them. Nearly 64% of Yemen's internally displaced people lack a source of income and access to food. Poverty is widespread. Schools and hospitals are barely functioning, while tens of thousands have been killed in the conflict. We are currently living in a time Jesus refers to as the birth pains. We are fast approaching a time known as the tribulation that Jesus says will be the worst time in human history, as we read in Matthew 24, 21. For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. We are currently witnessing events that will continue to become more frequent and more intense until God pours out his final judgments on an unbelieving and unrepentant world. One of the judgments described in the book of Revelation includes the price of food being so high and scarce that it will cost a full day's wages just to barely get enough to eat, as we read in Revelation 6, 5, and 6. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come and see. So I looked, and behold, a black horse, and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and the wine. In this prophecy, it will cost a day's wages just for a loaf of bread. We are not in the tribulation period yet, but we are getting extremely close. All right, despite the fact the pandemic is winding down, the meat industry is still hurting and may start hurting your wallet next. Uh, now some farmers are also dealing with the rising cost of animal feed. Lydia, who is at a farm in New Jersey that's really feeling the heat, she joins us now. Lydia, they're, they're not expecting things to get any better anytime soon, are they? No, Charles, they're really expecting these inflated costs to continue through the year. And some estimates predict that we could start seeing that trickling into the grocery stores with prices going up by roughly 5%, depending on what you're buying. We are at Rock Ridge Farm in Andover, New Jersey. 
Do you see my friends behind me? I'm getting to know some of this black Angus. These are black Angus steer. These cows are actually destined for the dinner plate, but in order to get there, they have to be fed. And the issue is that feeding them is getting more and more expensive as we're just seeing the price of corn and soy skyrocket over the past year. We're joined right now by the owner of this farm. This is John Van Butt that we have here with us. And John, you were explaining to me that the price to keep just one one of these cows fed for a year can be about four to five hundred dollars. Right. You've seen that jump over the past year by an additional two hundred dollars. Have you ever seen that kind of jump in price and your cost so far so fast? No, we're used to seeing slight increases here and there going up and then back down again and here and there. But over the last several months, the fuel and fertilizer prices have really skyrocketed and it's going to show in the beef coming in the next few months because it costs, you know, Two three hundred dollars more a cow to raise them, wow. and you only get five hundred pounds from a cow. So right, it's uh, it's, it's gonna quite the cost to contend with. Yes. So how are you gonna offset that? We're gonna have to raise our prices. Yeah. at the retail side of it, yes. Pass it along to the consumer. So, Charles, sure. what John actually does here is he sells his beef straight to the consumer. So people can stop by his farm and they can pick up, you know, some the ground beef or even quarters of cows here right. uh, and take it home for dinner and have that with the family. But for other folks that are shopping at the grocery store, you know, we're expecting meat producers all around the country to be going through the very same thing that John's experiencing here. They're going to ultimately pass it along to the grocery store, and that means you can expect your price of your ground beef or your pork even your poultry just going to climb this year amos 8 11. behold the days are coming says the lord god that it will send a famine on the land not a famine of bread nor a thirst for water but of hearing the words of the lord even worse than a famine of physical food is a famine of spiritual food because israel rejected the prophets god promised a severe judgment just as israel rejected the prophets the church today is rejecting God's word. How tragic to turn a deaf ear to God and be given a famine of hearing the words of the Lord. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready! The signs of Jesus soon return are so strong now and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with Him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive in faith the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in Him and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. 
In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. Biblical repentance is changing your mind about Jesus Christ and turning to God in faith for salvation. Turning from sin is not the definition of repentance, but it is one of the results of genuine, faith-based repentance towards the Lord Jesus Christ. Time is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today.